Inca says I can start, so I will. Before I do, it seems like since this is the last moment that we will all convene together, it might be worth giving Matt and Cody and Ginny and all the other interns and, and Yinka, who has stood there all week videotaping us all, a, a huge round of applause. And thanks. Thanks so much to you all. It's been it's been a fabulous, exhausting, and energizing week, and and you all are the ones who've made it possible. I'm going to read excerpts from a, a book-length polemic in progress against flow. I have not rehearsed these excerpts. My sense is that um, I will not go long. Is the mic on? Is it on? Can you hear me? Oh, good. Uh, I think this will be on the short side. And, and we can talk for a few minutes or um, convene in, in our workshops a little bit earlier than 10, perhaps. According to the Hungarian psychologist, Mihaly, <laughs> I wanted to get here early enough to do the big reveal, but you know, I love the way people just push the blackboard up. And, uh, when we are deeply engrossed in trying to reach a goal or when we are performing an activity that is challenging but well suited to our skills, we experience a joyful state called flow. The Taoist philosopher <laughs> suggests that happiness is nothing but the use of one's natural abilities and intuition to flow with one's environment. When one is fully engaged with what one is doing, for example, reading and writing, or writing, one begins to act effortlessly. Eventually, one's whole mindset changes from fear and avoidance to engagement and openness. In all things shining, reading the Western classics to find meaning in a secular age, the philosophers Hubert Dreyfus and Sean Kelly assert that letting the self get washed away in some action is the key to living a meaningful life. It is when we are, quote, taken over by the situation, unquote, that life really shines and matters most. So here's my straw man. You know what, I'm just gonna read it. I, I might read it twice. Here's my straw man. Flow, it's, it's a kind of formula based on these, these three little excerpts. Flow equals ease equals fullness, um, happiness, wholeness, fulfillment, life, also imagination, that, that um, flow is, is linked to the imagination in some fundamental way. More on that in a moment. Here's my, um, here's my, here's the thing I want to offer in opposition to that formula, or at least to, you know, I should put these, I, I should put these on the board. Actually, could somebody help me? Can you help me, Carly? Can you do that? Stasis, difficulty, hunger, sadness, fragmentation, con death, consciousness. Hold on just a minute. I have to finish reading this page in order to give it to you. <laughs> saying you're against flow is sort of like saying you're against happiness, or worse, against life, which is an absolutely ridiculous position to take, of course. And I'm not really against life or happiness. But I, I do want to try to map my resistance to flow. So a, a bit from the Booker Prize judge, Peter Strother, literary, literary works of art, he says, have to offer a degree of resistance. The Education of Henry Adams, do you know, you know that book? It's a traditional autobiography in nearly every way. It begins with the author's birth in 1838 and ends in 1905, 13 years before he died. In between, it moves pretty much chronologically. It moves absolutely chronologically, covering one or two or three years per chapter. But it resists flow in, in at least two significant ways. You know what they are? Can you name it, either of them? Anybody? It's a resistant autobiography. No? Anybody? It's written in the third person. Yeah. Is that what you were going to say? <laughs> well, no, but, but he tells you very little about what's actually going on in his life. 
Yes, yes, yes. You you find out very li- you find out a lot about events in the world around him, but very little about himself. It's written in the third person, so it's already got that detachment, the same detachment as Salman Rushdie's new memoir, Joseph Anton, um, which looks slightly less original, viewed against Henry Adams's autobiography of a century ago. The most interesting thing to me about the education of Henry Adams, though, is a is a twenty year hole in the middle of the text. He he really covers every year from his birth up until nineteen o five, except for a, a twenty year gap between nineteen seventy one. I mean eighteen seventy one and eighteen ninety two. Tell you at the end of the talk what happens in those twenty years. Any ideas? Do you know? No. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me feel so smart. And I'm not nice. I know almost nothing in the world, but I know what happened during those 20 years. At a, website, at a website titled Pursuit of Happiness, subtitled Bringing the Science of Happiness to Life, you can sign up for a weekend workshop at Yale, an online course in the psychology of happiness, or view a Happiness 101 webinar. You can also take the how happy are you quiz. (laughs) Sample question, quote, I find a deep sense of fulfillment in my life by using my strengths and skills toward a purpose greater than myself. You can answer never, rarely, sometimes, often, or almost always. Here's a question, is, is write, uh, 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 you know what, this is redundant, but is writing a talk against flow like writing a talk against happiness? I don't think so. I think I'm arguing for the kind of pleasure that comes from difficulty, from doing difficult things. In order to provide a canned lima bean with glamour, you must do a fan dance with it. That is from a great, great work of literature, The Joy of Cooking, the 1953 edition. In order to provide a canned lima bean with glamour, you must do a fan dance with it. I think I wrote this talk so that I could use that line. I want to say this. Writing is scary. Writing is terrifying. Writing breaks you down. Everything you write breaks you. It breaks you. If you don't know what I mean, if you don't want to be broken every time you sit down to write, then you are probably strong enough to be a doctor or a banker or a nuclear physicist instead of a writer. I want to say this again. What distinguishes writers from other people is not their brokenness, but their willingness to be broken every time they sit down to write. What about readers? Because of course we're all readers. What do readers want? What do we want when we sit down to read? We want to be, this wonderful word that that Bruce unpacked (coughs) on Monday, we want to be (coughs) ravished, right? We want to be carried off in the strong, unbroken arms of the writer. Quote, filled with ecstasy, intense delight, sensuous pleasure. We want our boundaries to be breached. We want to surrender. We want to be enraptured. We want to be entranced. That word that when you look on the page, look at on the page, you, you know that it means to be entranced. To be entranced is to be entr- entranced. Um, we want to be broken, and then we of course want to be made whole again. <coughs> Why am I using this pronoun, we, as if I can speak authoritatively for you? I imagine you all clustered around the coffee table after this talk telling each other how much you resist pronouns that coerce you rather than seduce your assent. I should probably just stick with what I know. In every encounter with text, I want to be flushed from hiding, forced out of my passive posture found out in some important way. This is a quote. The good piece of writing startles the reader back into life, capital L. 
Good writing never soothes or comforts. It is no prescription, neither is it diversionary, although it can and should enchant while it explodes in the reader's face. That's Joy Williams and Why I Write. Thank you very much. Sure. Here's Annie Dillard describing Dave Rom, a stunt pilot, in, in, some of, in, in possibly, you know, they're not my three favorite sentences in all of literature, but they're, 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 they're right up there. <laughs> I looked at the back of his head. I could see the serious line of his cheek and jaw. He was in shirt sleeves, tanned, strong-wristed. I could not imagine loving him under any circumstances. <clears throat> I love those three lines. I love the way that, that I'm, I'm leaning, I'm flowing, and, and then she, she catches me up short because, of course, I'm thinking, oh, she's falling in love with Dave Rom. The writer experiences flow, of course, as process, the feeling of being so caught up in the work that time and space recede, hours go by, the world of the text, the essay, story, or poem becomes more real than your surroundings. In this sense, of course, flow is another word for profound, focused, sustained attention. And again, who could argue against that? It sounds blissful. It is blissful. It is also like all blissful states, being in the womb, eating ice cream, shooting rapids or shooting pool, drinking wine with an old friend, unsustainable, even irresponsible. It is even, I might argue, a kind of death to the world. While we are writing, we are dead to the world. A few years ago, I was writing a talk. I, can't, I don't even remember what talk it was I was giving at this conference, but I was deeply, I was deeply immersed in it. Mostly, I was really afraid I wouldn't finish it in time. <laughs> I might have to show up without drying my hair. Um, and I, 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 so the, that, the talk conference is always, of course, in the third week in June. Um, and, and right around the, I had the 16th or 17th of June, I was supposed, I was co-hosting a going away party from, for some really good friends who were moving away from Hamilton, moving to Ohio. It was gonna be on the Village Green and I was responsible for dessert and, I, and all the paper goods, the plates and silverware and cups. And, and the 15th, it was the 15th of June, it, it came and went, and the conference came and went, and I gave my talk. And on the 4th of July, I went to a birthday party. <laughs> and the first people I saw when I walked up to the house for this 4th of July party were the, the, the people for whom I was supposed to co-host that going away party that I, I just, so that's like two weeks later, and I just like, I, I completely, forgot about that going away party for three weeks. Apparently somebody ran to Price Chopper and got some paper plates and nobody ever told me, but I, I, that's, you know, I, I, I just missed it, this party I was throwing. I missed it. The essence of being human is not to seek perfection, writes George Orwell in his wonderful essay on Gandhi. It's an essay against Gandhi. The title of the essay could be Against Gandhi. He argues that perfection e equals a kind of uh, a, a stillness that is the stillness of death, and um, that it's that the, the pursuit of perfection is a kind of that the, the rejection of messiness is is a rejection of of life, an embrace of death. The reader, of course, experiences flow as the feeling of being borne along. I've said something like this already by the current of voice or plot by the sense that the writer knows what he or she is doing and makes the doing of that thing seem effortless. Here's a quote. The enormous popularity of books that tell us how to achieve mastery in chess, cinch a business deal, or become a better parent with neither effort nor thought nor attention may turn on our preference for magical efficiency over honest toil. They reach the status of bestsellers for the same reason as do diet books that advocate eating as much as you want as long as you abstain from some arbitrary category of food, not because they work, but because they are easy to follow. This is Barbara Vale Montero writing in the New York Times on the 10th of June. If the vessel in which we're being borne along on the current of a text, I use the passive here on purpose, 
is broken. If the GPS loses contact with its satellites, the seams of the boat split and water pours in. Has an act of betrayal taken place? Has a contract between writer and reader, the one in which the writer promises to be stronger, wholer, holier than the reader been broken? The word I'm thinking of, of course, is authority. We want writers and narrators to wield it effortlessly. The writer may have begun writing in darkness, in uncertainty, in ambivalence, but we readers don't want to see any trace of those messy things in the end. Or do we? Quote, we are in the process of a mind puzzling its way out of its own shadows, moving from unearned certainty to thoughtful reconsideration to clarified self-knowledge. I love that sequence, unearned certainty, thoughtful reconsideration, clarified self-knowledge. The act of clarifying on the page is an intimate part of the metaphor. You nonfiction writers will know who that is, right? Yes, it's Vivian, Vivian Gornick situation in the story. Some years ago at this conference, I gave a talk on lists. In this talk on lists, I said that they are wonderful, um, that they are particular, they're musical, they're surprising, that most writers fall into one of two camps, storytellers or taxonomists, meaning list makers, blah, blah, blah. It was a uh, as these things go, sort of a modest base hit. That was on a Tuesday. On Wednesday, Bruce gave a talk on lists. <laughs> he didn't just hit a home run. He didn't hit the ball out of the park. That ball is like still out there flying through space. <laughs> it's two or three solar systems away, but it's still like flying. In Bruce's talk, he said, lists are wonderful, lists are particular, lists convey this wonderful phrase of Bruce's, the spongy thinginess of the world. But then he said something really important. He said the thing that really matters, the thing that I, I could not see, is that a list, when it really works, is, is only a prologue. It's like a runway. It's the thing that enables the writer to leap into the air. And what matters, of course, is, is that that leap, and he used the word fugue and, and unpacked that word as he unpacked ravished for us, a word that contains uh, run, fugitive to run, right? Con Latin, confusion. To flee. to flee, to flee. It's related to fugitive, to flee, to run away. But it's also related to, to confusion, right? The fugue state in, in, uh, in uh, psychiatry is, is to, be, to be confused. So here's the thing about writers' conferences. <laughs> they break you. <laughs> you come to them, even after many, many years of writing, even when you are fraudulently on the faculty side of the aisle, you come bearing this frail, fledgling thing. You think, it's little now, but it will grow up into something big and strong that can soar over rivers and mountains. You think, I'm doing okay. I published a couple of things last year. I've got a substantial project simmering on the front burner and something savory in a pot behind it. Then, uh, I can't, I'm picking on, I don't, I don't mean to pick on you, Bruce. Then Bruce Smith reads Devotion, Red Roof Inn. <laughs> and at first, pleasure washes over you, engulfs you, swallows you up. Then then Mark Doty's then, then you find that you are broken, curled up in a fetal position on the bedroom floor thinking there's no point. <laughs> then a couple of days later, if you've got any gumption at all, you pick yourself up off the floor and put the wine bottle in the recycling and turn on the computer. You remind yourself that you are not diminished by the success of others. What good writers do, what good writing does always is to push back the boundaries of the possible. It fills us with pleasure, it fills us with despair, it makes us roll up our sleeves and get back to work. Quote, what if the scaffolding did not come down? 
Or what if the work of art came down and the scaffolding stayed up? If a work of art had sufficient energy, could it support the scaffold, keep it propped up indefinitely? That's Susan Mitchell writing in Notes Toward a History of Scaffolding. For me right now, the, the most urgent question is how to capture in that final draft the sense of drama and danger that I felt in the first. I love dashes and parentheses, starts and stops, ellipses, something I call hem stitching, which I can talk more about later if, you, if you're interested. Polyvocality, he do the police in different voices. Also, I love silence. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry once flew through a cyclone in the Andes. After landing, he climbed out of the cockpit and walked away from the platoon of men who just helped him wrestle the plane back into the hangar. He said nothing to them. Quote, there was nothing to say. I was very sleepy. I kept moving my fingers, but they stayed numb. I could not collect my thoughts enough to decide whether or not I had been afraid. Had I been afraid? I couldn't say. I had witnessed a strange sight. What strange sight? I couldn't say. The sky was blue and the sea was white. I felt I had to tell someone about it since I was back from so far away, but I had no grip on what I had been through. Imagine a white sea, very white, whiter still. You cannot convey things to people by piling up adjectives, by stammering. Maybe what matters most in writing is a sense of purpose and urgency that pushing forward against resistance, against constraint. Instead of the authority of competence or expertise, maybe the authority of curiosity. My gripe with flow is that it detaches me or promises to detach me from all that is difficult about life and about writing, from hunger, from desire, from restlessness, from ambition, from pain, from loss, from grief. Like a lullaby, flow seeks to comfort and console and soothe, and in that sense feels to me essentially false. Says Wallace Stevens, in the presence of extraordinary actuality, consciousness takes the place of imagination. And this is, this is what, what I, I, what I want to do is sort of mix up these categories, I guess. That, you know, the imagination is not the, the thing associated with life and happiness, but, but, but consciousness, being, being, being awake. How far would I push this argument? Not nearly as far as David Shields. <laughs> In a talk last fall, he argued passionately against all forms of narrative writing. Storytelling, he said, is bubble wrap. It seals and protects us from life instead of illuminating it as literature <coughs> ought. Oops, sorry. Narrative, he argued, is incongruent with the speed of our lives in the 21st century. It denies and belies the chaos and entropy that threaten to overwhelm us in every moment. It works chronologically. It builds diachronically from cause and effect one step at a time. Um, and this is not the way the world comes at us, Shields points out, which is absolutely right. The world comes at us more synchronously. Um, information, sensations, they hit us from all directions at once, um, simultaneously. I wouldn't go that far, but here's how far I would go. I would argue against, push against, resist, clear glass writing, this is a distinction my friend Carrie Brown makes, clear glass writing versus stained glass writing. I can say more about that in a minute. False dichotomies, uh, <laughs> flow equals happiness equals imagination, as opposed to stasis, uh, sadness, hunger, death. Um, absolutes, earnestness, safe writing, logic, symmetry, promises made and then fulfilled, seamless narrative, prefab forms, certainty, confidence, authority, flatness, empty eloquence, 
flights of fancy, wholeness, coolness, smoothness, polish, as you can see from this list, form and content and tone, the writer's attitude toward the writing, are all jumbled together along with, with aesthetics and philosophy and psychology. It's the, the mess behind the closet door. What I'm arguing for is, is a kind of more messiness, more messiness in writing, more surprise, playfulness, contrariness, resistance, of course, cracks in the sidewalk, huge rapids in the river, gigantic boulders, bus-sized holes, dangerous writing, difficult writing, writing that is dangerous for the writer and dangerous for the reader, difficult for the writer, difficult for the reader, discomfort, meaning that accrues through juxtaposition and accretion of detail, lists, fugues, collage, which is, of course, from the French word meaning to glue. So it's a word that holds both to, for those two, two meanings, be, being broken, being in many pieces, and glued together um, in that one word. Uncertainty, fear, heat, fragmentation, absence, white space, shards, asymmetry, texture, paradox, surprise, Writing that is not merely broken, but that enacts brokenness. In the first chapter of A Room of One's Own, Virginia Woolf writes, Here then was I, parentheses, call me Mary Beaton, Mary Seaton, Mary Carmick, Michael, or by any name you please. It is not a matter of any importance, close parentheses, sitting on the banks of a river a week ago or two in fine October weather, lost in thought. And here she is maddeningly in the final chapter of that book. Mary Carmichael, I thought, still hovering at a little distance above the page while half her work <coughs> cut out for her merely as an observer. In the preface to Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, possibly the most resistant work of journalism ever published. James A.G. says the book is merely portent and fragment, experiment, dissonant, prologue. He says it is meant to be the first volume of a larger work titled Three Tenant Families. Let Us Now Praise Famous Men is 471 pages long, and there is no larger work. Here's a headline from The Guardian dated June 7th of this year. Pursuit of Happiness radio show couple found dead in New York. <laughs> New York police say that John Littig and Lynn Rosen, who ran the call-in show called The Pursuit of Happiness, died together in their New York apartment earlier this week. In separate notes, Littig said they were determined to die together while Rosen apologized to her family. In a recent show, Liddig tells listeners, so much of life is about impulse. It's about doing it right now. Go with your gut. Imagination is more important than knowledge. And I'll end here with a fragment from Mary Oliver's notebooks published in Blue Pastures. But I want to say something more uncomfortable even than that. 